okay good afternoon so this is our 21st lecture and uh, uh, in the previous lecture we have started our discussion on uh, wall bounded flows here basically our uh, particles are influenced by the presence of the walls okay so if you recall uh, then we discussed about the uh, rigid particles when these are placed either at the uh, center of a cylindrical pipe or at some eccentricity from the pipe okay particularly in case of a poisley flow situation now we will try to see uh, the fluid particles if fluid particles are present in the vicinity of the wall then what will be happening okay so uh, you recall this situation from the uh, previous lecture as well so what we have say this is a pipe in this pipe uh, I can have different type of flow situation but one of the flow situation which is considered over here that is laminar flow having parabolic velocity profile with u0 velocity at the center r is radius of the pipe and this is my radial direction and I have a particle of diameter small d and this is located at distance v and it is, is uh, traveling down with velocity u and then I told you if we slightly change the reference frame to our particle we consider that everything we are measuring with reference to the particle if we fix our reference frame on particle then we will be experiencing that velocity of wall which is in physical scenario is stationary with reference to particle it will become capital U okay and uh, this is our ith direction and similarly the velocity with which particle is approaching the fluid that is the free stream velocity for this case that will become i times u plus u naught into 1 minus r square by r square and this lambda over here is actually called as diameter ratio okay so already we have seen this discussion for rigid particles in the previous lecture now we will try to see for uh, fluid particles okay so typically when we will be talking about the fluid particles in wall confined flows we will be dividing our system into two sub parts okay so in first case we will be considering all the situations where lambda is less than equal to 0.6 and second situation we will consider when lambda is greater than 0.6 okay so typically when value of lambda is less than 0.6 then also for this type of situation also we can have different different possibilities of the flow conditions so possibilities of flow conditions can be low Reynolds number it can be intermediate Reynolds number or it can be high Reynolds number but in all these cases value of lambda first we are considering is less than equal to 0.6 okay so now this typical case is corresponding to a very low Reynolds number so in case of lambda less than 0.6 we will be finding that even if we are having fluid particles which are nothing but of deformable fluid particles if we have low Reynold number then also uh, in case of low Reynold number despite of the presence of fluid particle we will be having actually small deformations okay so the meaning is if my fluid particles are not deforming then whatever the formulations I have applied for solid spheres almost similar formulations I can apply over here with slight correction to account for the variation of the viscosity okay so that's why this relation of drag force is given over here pi mu du into k so this is something which we have seen for the case of a rigid sphere but in this I have another factor which is coming because of the circulations present within the fluid particles. So that factor is 2 plus 3k divided by 1 plus k. And this uh, settling factor or correction factor k can be obtained using this particular relation which is nothing but simply function of lambda and kappa. So kappa over here is nothing but ratios of viscosity of the particle divided by viscosity of the surrounding fluid okay so if you know the value of lambda and if you know the value of viscosity ratios you can calculate this correction factor and using this relation you can actually calculate the value of drag force okay is this point clear so this particular relation will give 
correct predictions of drag force or terminal velocities when our value of lambda is less than or equal to uh, 0.25. Okay. Uh, moreover, along with this, one more relation is also proposed, which is which also gives the reasonable accuracy for fluid particles, and uh, this relation is uh, almost the same. But in this relation, along with k and k dash, uh, along with k we have k dash also, and along with u we have u naught also. Where u naught is nothing but terminal velocity for same fluid particle in unconfined fluid. Okay. So the similar data can also be presented in terms of presence of unconfined system and in this scenario you will be finding value of k is identical to what we have estimated for the rigid sphere whereas value of k dash can be obtained from this particular relation. And one simple example of this uh, one small simplification of this relation is that whenever your value of kappa will be approaching to infinity. When kappa is approaching to infinity, what is the meaning of that? It means we are moving towards the presence of a rigid solid particle. So when value of kappa will be approaching to infinity, then k dash will become identical to that of the value which we have listed in a table in the previous lecture for a rigid particle. Is this point clear? So it means that whenever we have the small particles present, particularly at low Reynolds number, then only effect we have to account for is the circulation, internal circulation present within the fluid particle. Whereas the deformation of the fluid particles for lambda less than 0.6 will be very small at low Reynolds numbers. Okay. Is this one clear? And the scenarios where value of kappa, which is ratio of viscosities, is approaching to infinity, our majority of the drag estimation formulations will be becoming identical to what ones uh, what we have seen for rigid spherical particles in the previous lecture. Okay. Then comes intermediate sizes of drops and bubbles. So typically in case of intermediate size of drops and bubbles, we are listing over here only those cases for which value of inverse number is less than 40. Because when value of if worst number is greater than 40, then our sizes will be actually larger. Okay. So, in these scenarios, uh, this is the ratio of velocities, means terminal velocity in wall bounded flow divided by terminal velocity of the same fluid particles in unbounded flow. Okay. And in the abscissa, I have diameter ratio plotted. Okay. So, here you can see. This is the experimental data obtained from different sources. So you can see that up to lambda value of 0 0.6, 0 0.5 or 0 0.6, majority of this experimental data is actually clustering together and uh, forming dependence only on a single parameter lambda. Okay, so all these data points these are scattering close to a uh, this single line and the value of and this particular single line can be correlated with this correlation ut by ut infinity equal to 1 minus lambda square power 3 by 2. So it means that in case of intermediate drops and bubbles if these are present in wall bounded flows then their terminal velocities are mainly influenced by the value of lambda. Okay. So these are not dependent upon any other parameters particularly up to the value of lambda 0 0.6 and after that you will see that there is significant scatter of data from this line. So after this we have to go for some other relations which we will discuss in the subsequent discussion. And uh, whenever you will be calculating the Reynolds number resign, okay, this is the Reynolds number resign limit of Reynolds number within which 
there is not much deformation in the shape of the fluid particle. So here you can see that if lambda is very less than uh, 0.06, so corresponding to that Reynold number less than 0.1, your relation of simply rigid sphere can be applied because there you will not face much deformation. If your lambda is in this range and Reynold number is uh, in the range of 0.1 to 100, then you can actually fit your data particularly in these two cases you can fit your data using these simple equations. So, whenever we are referring to the intermediate, uh, uh, intermediate drop sizes corresponding to that we also have the conditions of Reynolds number ok. Because if Reynolds number will be large then in that case what will be happening again we will be having the deformation in the shape of particles. So, corresponding to each value of lambda uh, sorry corresponding to each value of Reynolds number these are the limits of lambda up to which we can consider that drops or bubbles will be present without deformations. Okay. If for these individual values of Reynolds number we keep the lambda beyond these then we will uh, see subsequent oscillations in the shape of the fluid particles. Okay. Then we have final system. So, here also again lambda is less than equal to 0 0.6 but my bubbles and drops are of larger size. So, this larger size is accounted for by presence of the Yudhvos number. So, EO is greater than equal to 40. Okay. So, it means here we are nothing but referring to the large diameter pipes. So, in case of large diameter pipes what will be happening? Overall bubble size will be large but with reference to the diameter of the pipe my value of lambda will be small. Okay. So, in this type of systems uh, what you can see that when we have this type of systems then typically the shapes for different systems are shown over here. So, here you can see when lambda is 0 0.129 and Reynolds number is 217 then this is the shape. Okay. And when your lambda is 0 0.261 means value of lambda is increasing it means volume or diameter of the particle is increasing. So, when diameter of the particle is increasing you can see corresponding to that value of Reynolds number is actually decreasing. So, it means that when particle size is increasing in the tail portion I have more elongated section of the fluid. Okay. So, here you can see this elongation of the fluid is increasing. So, here this is the front portion, here this is the front portion and here this is the front portion. So, it means behind the front portion tail po length of the tail portion is actually increasing upon increasing the value of lambda. So, when the length of the tail portion increases it results in decrease of the terminal velocity. So, because of which you are experiencing that values of Reynolds number are actually decreasing. So, in case of large bubble resigns particularly for lambda less than 0.6 you will be finding that when you are increasing the value of lambda corresponding to that the length of the tail portion will increase and as the length of the tail portion is increasing it will try to decrease the terminal velocity. If it is decreasing the terminal velocity you will experience that flow separation will delay. So, flow separation or you can say wake formation, wake formation behind the bubble will delay in this particular case, bubble or drop will delay in this particular case and at the same point of time upon increase in length of this uh, tail portion you will be experiencing that you will be experiencing that size of the wake will also decrease. So, that is something which you can see over here. So, here you have different diameters. When you are increasing the diameter, it means you are increasing the value of lambda, your value of terminal velocity of fluid particle is actually decreasing. 
because you are having more longer tail portion okay so because of the presence of more length, longer tail portion you will be having large interfacial cell okay so because of which your value of terminal velocity is decreasing and renold number is also decreasing and at the same point of time your wake volume is also actually so flow is slowing down, Renault number is decreasing, so that's why weight volume is also actually decreasing in this particular case. And for this large bubble resign, again you can simply write your ratios of terminal velocities, like terminal velocity in wall bounded divided by terminal velocity in unconfined system as 1.13 times exponential of minus lambda, particularly in the range of lambda from 0.125 to Okay. Then we have next case. So next case is when value of lambda is greater than 0. 0.6. So when value of lambda is greater than 0. 0.6, then particularly the analysis of rigid particles is not possible. Okay. If you consider simply a glass tube. And in that glass tube, if you just drop a solid wall, a solid wall having value lambda less than 0.6. So that will be particularly following the straight path and you will be able to see the hydrodynamics of that ball with the surrounding flow. But if you consider lambda greater than 0.6 and then if you drop a solid wall into a glass tube, you will be experiencing that, that drop solid wall will not only interfere with the will not only interfere with the fluid, but it also try to strike to the wall. And as you will keep on increasing the value of lambda, whenever ideally you will be reaching the value of lambda equal to 1, that particular solid particle will just stop within the pipe and it, it will stuck inside the pipe. Okay. So it means that whenever value of lambda is greater than 0 0.6, then solid either the motion of solid particle will cease or it will lead to solid interaction uh, sol interaction of the solid particle with the surface of the wall so that's why that type of analysis cannot be hydrodynamically fully explained okay so that is the reason for lambda greater than 0 0.6 you will not find any system where solid particles are actually studied but on contrary, if you have fluid particles present, then even if your value of lambda is greater than 1, then also flow is possible. Why? Can you tell me? What is the meaning of lambda greater than 1? Lambda greater than 1 meaning is that equivalent dia of fluid particle is greater than the internal diameter of the pipeline. So that is possible because in case of fluid particles, if you have larger volume present corresponding to which your equivalent diameter is coming greater than the pipe diameter, you will be having actually deformation in the shape of fluid particle and that deformation will actually uh, lead to elongation of the bubble in the vertical direction. Is this point clear? So here what will happen? There will be elongation of the drop or bubble in the vertical direction. So that is the reason that uh, whenever lambda is greater than 0.6, majority of the time actually we refer uh, our systems in terms of only the fluid particle. Okay. And typically the systems for which lambda is greater than 0.6, these are dominated by elongation of particles in axial direction. Elongation of particularly fluid particles in axial direction. Okay. Because of this elongation, you will see that your majority of the pipe diameter is actually filled by fluid particle. So here you can see if this is your pipe surface. So here majority of the portion of this uh, pipe is actually filled by the fluid particle and in the surroundings of that you have nothing but surrounding continuous fluid. So you have a thin film of continuous fluid. So if we consider a vertical system for which lambda is greater than 
0.6 that type of flow resign is typically called as slug flow okay and the shape of fluid particle is typically referred to as slug bubble or slug drop in this paper okay and this is also known as this is also known as typically a taylor bubble or taylor drop so it means that your system in your system if value of lambda is greater than 0.6 then only you will be able to uh, say that you are having the presence of the slug flow or slug bubble okay and typically slug bubble is determined by the rounded bullet shaped nose and then so the it is consisting of two parts so first is a rounded bullet shaped nose which i can simply called as a ellipsoidal shape and behind this ellipsoid i have a cylinder and then this cylinder is having some film of continuous fluid along its periphery okay so typically this type of system can be divided into three different categories so very first category is viscosity and surface tension forces are negligible so this scenario will be possible when molten number for the flow is less than 10 to power minus 6 and if host number is greater than 100 okay and typically in this resign if you have to calculate the if you have to calculate the velocity of the bubble that can be obtained using this master curve okay so here in this master curve you have idvos number on axisa and you have fraud number on ordinate and what is fraud number terminal velocity of the drop or bubble divided by under root gd where d is internal diameter of pipe because in this resign the thickness of the annular film is actually very very small okay so that's why majorly we are defining the length scale for the fluid particle identical to that of internal diameter of the pipe okay and typically this curve you can see that these lines are corresponding to the different values of molten number so this is for molten number 10 to power minus 6 and then uh, this data is for higher values of molten number so when i am referring to the value of molten number less than 10 to power minus 6 then particularly i am referring to this portion of the curve okay so here you can see that this particular curve is also again divided into four different sub parts so first is this type of left to right inclined hatched portion so this is the portion over here okay so in this portion your value of idvos number is so small that bubbles will almost remains stagnant within the system and these will not rise okay and in this particular resign your shape of the bubble can be simply balanced by the balance of hydrostatic and the surface tension forces okay and then when you increase the value of molten number then you will be finding your value of actually it was number is increasing okay and you have then another resign which is close to the very small values of fraud number so when fraud number is less than 0.01 corresponding to uh, sorry 0.05 corresponding to that we call that our inertia effect is actually very very small so this particular domain of the curve is independent of inertial effects then we have this rightward portion this portion is independent of surface tension okay and then in the center we have some portion which is actually independent of viscosity so depending upon the interplay of different forces if the relative magnitude of one particular type is very small in comparison to other forces then depending upon that this particular curve is actually divided into different parts okay and here you can see that the shape 
this is the shape of a bubble which is rising vertically uh, in a pipe okay and uh, typically in this particular enzyme when viscosity and surface tension effects are negligible experimentally it is observed that value of froud number for this system is actually coming constant it means that velocity of the bubble does not depend upon any parameter other than the diameter of the pipe is this one clear for viscosity and surface tension negligible design so it means the design in which your motor number value is less than equal to 10 to power minus 6 and inverse number is greater than 100 for that particular design you will be finding that your value of froud number from different experiments is actually coming out to be constant so the meaning is that velocity of a taylor bubble in negligible viscosity design is mainly governed by the diameter of the pipe okay it does not depend upon any other parameter if you have a larger diameter pipe then your taylor bubble velocity will be large if diameter of the pipe is small then bubble velocity will be small okay so it is a sole function of diameter of the pipe is this point clear because the ratio frd which is ut by root gd is constant it is not even depending upon it is not even depending upon the viscosity of the fluid so it means if you consider you have two different tubes of same diameter and both are having say air bubble air taylor bubble okay and one tube is having water as your surrounding continuous fluid and other tube is having some viscous oil as your surrounding continuous fluid in both cases you will be having the same value of the velocity density is to change sorry density or chlorine will be different so the term uh, density of one letter of course density will have effect but what i am trying to say i am trying to like uh, emphasize on the viscous effect okay so if you are keeping density ratios in the similar conditions but changing the viscosity in that scenario you will not experience any change in the velocity of the bubble okay so it means in two different tubes considering that <coughs> density ratios are same but viscosity is changing then also you will be having almost same velocity of the taylor bubble okay and uh, then we have second design which is surface tension dominant design so surface tension dominant design it means value of ethbos number is very very small that is less than 3.4 in this case we will be having motion less bubble as i told you earlier also so we will be having motion less bubble and majorly its shape will be determined by balance of hydrostatic and capillary forces okay and then we have third design which is viscosity dominant design in case of viscosity dominant design if those number is greater than 70 and froud number is less than 0.05 okay so in this case what will be happening your value of terminal velocity will be inversely proportional to viscosity okay and here if you increase the viscosity then your value of terminal velocity will decrease and typically one very interesting uh, fact you will be experiencing this is in the viscosity independent design shape of the bubble in viscosity independent design and this is in viscosity dependent design so can you see the difference what is the difference if you see in this case you have flat tail with slight wavy structure okay but if you have viscous dominant design then you will be having a perfect ellipsoidal shape over here so in the trailing edge you will be having 
oblate ellipsoid and in the leading edge you will be having a prolate ellipsoid okay so that is the difference so typically in viscosity independent design you will be having a flat bubble with highly turbulent wake structure highly turbulent wake structure so this is a schematic representation but in real scenario you will be finding that in viscosity independent design behind this taylor bubble there will be lot of interface fluctuations and large number of small small bubbles will be actually forming behind a larger bubble but on contrary in viscosity dominant design you will be finding a very smooth oblate ellipsoidal tail and a prolate ellipsoidal starting okay and when viscosity effect is dominant then of course what will be happening this viscosity effect will change the so if you zoom in into this portion so if you zoom in into this portion this is my wall and this is the bubble and this bubble is rising in upward direction wall is stationary and this liquid film is moving in downward direction so in this portion i will be having formation of a velocity profile within the liquid film okay and this velocity profile will actually govern the interfacial shear so when you have viscosity independent design in that particular case your interfacial shear is negligible so if interfacial shear is negligible majorly the bubble velocity is controlled by the starting tip shape of the bubble so that is the reason in previous design i told you that tip shape depends upon the diameter of the pipe and velocity of the bubble is simply function of diameter of the pipe okay and behind this whatever length of the tail portion you take despite of the length of the tail portion you will be getting almost same value of terminal velocity so meaning is like you you have same two pipes in one pipe say you have 1 cm long taylor bubble in other pipe you have 2 cm long taylor bubble in third pipe of same diameter you have 5 cm long taylor bubble but if these are in the viscosity independent design then you will be finding all the bubbles will be having the same value of terminal velocity okay on contrary if you go to the viscosity dependent design then when you will increase the length along with increase in length your value of velocity will actually decrease is this point clear so for taylor bubbles if we are in the viscosity independent design then despite any length of the tailing uh, tail portion we will be having the same value of velocity if diameter of the pipe is same on contrary if we are in the viscosity dominant design then this viscous interfacial viscous forces which are acting because of the presence of the downward motion of the liquid film these will increase if we are increasing the length and our value of terminal velocity will be actually change okay now we have slug flow in non cylindrical cross section okay so in case of uh, non cylindrical cross section you can have any configuration for example rectangular square annular okay so majorly it was uh, uh, given that if i have any configuration say this is a rectangular one <coughs> so one side of the channel is having dia d1 and other side of the channel is having dia d2 so then froude number can be calculated as function 0.23 into 0.13 d2 by d1 okay and if you have say annular section so this is solid tube of internal uh, of external dia di and this is a hollow tube of dia do internal dia do in this case your bubble will be actually staying in this portion so in case of annular portion you will be having actually velocity something like this okay but one interesting fact is that what is your hypothesis you will think that if you have say a annular section 
then in case of annular section you may think your bubble will be forming a ring like structure something like this this is something which you may experience okay but in reality you will be finding if you have a annular tube your bubble will not be having <coughs> closed ring like structure but it will be forming a open ring like structure is this point clear so experimental evidence shows that like in a normal tube what we have we have a perfectly axisymmetric shape of the taylor bubble and it is so our expectation is that when we will be having the annular portion i will be having some downward film motion in this area and then in the center i will be having a perfectly closed ring like structure okay but experimental evidence shows that it is very difficult for low viscous fluids to sustain a perfectly <coughs> ring structure and we have this open type of encapsulated fluid particle structure when we are having the envelope process okay so here like surface forces are not that strong that these will be forming a perfect structure because here inertia forces will be dominating so we will be finding that breakage of the ring structure will be happening and we will be having this type of a open envelope in which uh, uh, this fluid particle will be actually moving so what i will do probably um, i forgot to include today in the next uh, class i will try to include some uh, experimental or numerical snapshots of taylor bubble in a uh, envelope okay so people have recently also performed some experiments when initially they were having a normal tube and then they have suddenly introduced the annular section and then people have seen the transformation of bubble into a annular bubble with open envelope like structure and then what are the different transformation stages and how these stages are actually growing so these are the studies which are published like in very recent years means somewhere close to uh, 2015 16 or 18 so maybe in majority of the textbooks you actually you will not uh, find uh, uh, this type of transformation so in the existing literature you may find a complete annular tube how bubble is actually moving in annular tube but what are the different transformation stages from a normal taylor bubble to an annular taylor bubble that is something which recently people have done okay then we have third case in which we will be having the presence of uh, slug flow in inclined tube some idea i had given you in the very initial class also that if we have inclined tube then we see that when with reference to vertical angle of inclination is increased from 0 degree then at an angle of 45 degrees experimental evidence shows that we have almost the highest velocity and when we further increase the angle then value of terminal velocity actually decreases okay so major reason is when we are having uh, this uh, uh, ratio of terminal velocity in inclined system divided by terminal velocity in vert vertical system so for vertical system these were only the function of irvos number and motor number now we will be having inclination angle also as an additional parameter okay and in this type of system what happens the shape of the bubble is not symmetric bubble tries to adhere more closer to the top portion of this pipe and bottom portion is having actually large curvature available for the flow of the fluid so because of this the shape of the bubble gains some interfacial structure corresponding to which actually we have least resistance it means presence of least drag force for an angle of 
45 degrees. Okay, and beyond this, if you change the angle, then shape of the drop will actually try to become more symmetric, and corresponding to that, the drag force will be actually increased. Okay, so that is the reason. Again, uh, majorly uh, these are driven from the experimental evidences, and to uh, do the complete analysis of this type of system once again uh, uh, people have attempted for numerical simulations in the recent years okay is this point clear so now one important thing till now whatever analysis we have studied here we considered that all the fluid particles which we are under consideration these are following the continuum Okay. So, for all these molecules actually, our molecular effects were negligible. So, majorly the entire analysis were based on the continuum approach. Okay. We also know that uh, if we keep on decreasing the size of the solid particles or fluid particles to the scales lesser than 1 micrometer or even smaller, then we will be finding that our value of Nansen number will be actually very very large, not small. What is Nansen number? Nansen number is mean free path divided by diameter of the particle. So basically it depends upon the macroscopic length scale. So as we are referring in the present system we are actually pointing towards the motion of the particle. So the other length scale I have taken diameter of the particle. Okay. So, when our mean free path of the molecules, what is lambda m? Lambda m is nothing but mean free path of the molecules. Now, do you know what is the meaning of mean free path of molecules? So, distance traveled by molecules between the two successive collisions. Okay. So, if mean free path is comparable to the size of the particle, it means that you have some system where these are the molecules of the these are the molecules of the continuous fluid and this is a particle okay so in this type of system your nansen number like mean free path is comparable to the particle size so in this case your value of nansen number will be close to 1 okay so, if value of Nansen number is close to 1, corresponding to that our approach of continuum will not be valid. So, in this case what will happen, when this molecule is actually moving, it will, it, there may be possibility that this molecule is actually striking with the particle. Okay. Now, when the molecule is coming towards the particle, size of particle is also very very small. So, what will happen when this molecule will strike with the particle, this particle will get displaced because of the collision with this molecule. Then some other molecule may interfere with this particle at this location and then that molecule is having sufficient inertia in order to displace this particle because now particle size is very very small. Okay. So, in this case, we will be finding that the motion of the particle will be influenced by the random motion of the molecules. So, this type of motion is called as Brownian motion. Okay. So, when the motion of smaller particles is influenced by the random molecular motions, that particular motion is called as Brownian motion. So, whatever the analysis we have presented till now, that does not include these effects and we are majorly talking about the particle sizes which are significantly larger than the ones for which Brownian motion can take place. If you have larger particle, with larger particle also molecules are striking, but they cannot displace or influence their motion. Okay, So, that is why in case of larger particles, majorly the motion of the particle is contributed because of the forces originated from the average properties of the fluid. Continue. So, that is one uh, assumption which you need to consider, uh, which you need to keep into mind that uh, 
if someone says that whatever the analysis we have applied with that analysis can you predict the brownian motion so that is something which is not possible okay then second important point is we can have some cases where the value of value of nansen number is finite okay means it is lesser than 1 but it is in the say transition range from continuum to molecular effect okay so it is finite but still it is small small enough to apply the approximation of continuum so in that border condition if you calculate drag force then that drag force can be modified by this multiplying factor 1 plus 2a into k where a is some constant whose order is actually unit so means value of a will be of the order of 1 okay is this point clear so if you go for small but finite nansen number cases then your drag force acting on a particle should be corrected with this multi multiplier in order to account for the molecular effects but if you go for very large values of nansen number close to 1 corresponding to that your motion will be influenced by the molecular motions and continuum of approach will not be valid and there typically the random motion of the particles is called as nothing but brownian motion okay and this type of brownian motion has tendency to diffuse the particle into the bulk of the medium because say your your particle can actually travel throughout because whenever randomly molecule will actually strike with it it will just its motion or its velocity will be influenced by the by the impact of the molecule with this particle okay so typically uh, this is the diffusion diffusivity for value of diffusivity for brownian motion so diffusivity can be given in terms of boltzmann constant times temperature of the fluid medium divided by 6 pi mu into r so this is the rate at which fluid particle will be diffusing into the system because of the brownian motion okay now there is one uh, concept which is called as thermophoresis so at molecular level what can happen if you have say in your system two types of molecules in one side you have molecules whose temperature is large so high temperature molecules and in other side you have cold temperature molecules so in this case what will be happening if you have a particle over here this particle will be experiencing more force because of the high temperature molecules because high temperature molecules will be having larger vibrations so because of this this particle will be transported from high temperature zone to low temperature zone okay so this type of motion is called as thermophoresis is this point clear then second type of motion is at the molecular level is called as photophoresis so in case of photophoresis you what you can have is say these are the again the molecules here also you have molecules and then some particle here so you are subjecting this system to some sort of radiations okay and you have non uniform radiation intensity so in this portion your radiation intensity is high and in this portion your radiation intensity intensity is low so then again here you will be having high energy particle and because of the non uniform radiation when particle motion is influenced in certain direction that is called as photophoresis and then there is third quantity which is called as sonophoresis so in case of sonophoresis actually you can have different amplitude of sound waves okay so you can have say in one portion of this room different sound wave in other portion of this room different sound wave for example i am speaking so exactly the molecules which are just in the vicinity of my mouth these will be having more energy in other portion far away from this energy will be less so if i consider any dust particles which are just in the vicinity of my mouth these will be transported from this point to some portion away from that because of these uh, sound waves so that is called as sonophoresis okay so all these are molecular effects just for your uh, जो 
difference is because whenever you are only considering say the uh, when you are considering the temperature effect because of any mode okay any mode means conduction convection or other modes then you are specifically naming the uh, then you are naming it as a thermophoresis but when you are specifically considering the effect of only radiations then we are calling it as photosynthesis sub part me yes okay so these are just for your understanding and just to make differentiation that whatever analysis we have done that is not applicable for these type of system so if you have very small particles then whatever analysis we have done that is not applicable then comes another important point so till now whatever analysis for particles we have done that is considering that all the particles are moving at uniform velocity in the stagnant field so it means if particles are having uniform velocity there is no acceleration of the particle okay but in real scenario what can have we can have acceleration of the particle at the same point of time we can have reverse situation that particle is moving at constant velocity but the continuous fluid which is containing the particle that is having acceleration or we can have more generic scenario that both particle as well as the surrounding continuous fluid both are accelerating okay so in that scenario our situation will be more complicated so when we can have unsteady particle motion okay so for unsteady particle motion when you will be writing the equation of motion of for a particle then you have to consider actually different forces so first is we know that from newton second law that uh, mass of particle should be equal to the net sum of forces acting on the particle okay uh, sorry inertia of the particle so that is what i have written over here so mp into dv by dt where this bold v represents the velocity vector of the particle okay so mp into dv by dt represents the rate of change of momentum of the particle and another important point is here whenever i am writing this unsteady particle equation motion this i am considering a rigid constant volume particle okay now on this particle what different kind of forces can act first will be body force this is body force then second will be the forces because of the fluid on the particle so forces because of the surrounding fluid on the particle we have estimated till now one very very important force and that is nothing but our drag force which comes because of the relative motion in between the particle and the fluid so fd over here is to account for drag force okay so drag force is typically considered in a direction parallel to the motion of the particle but there can be certain force on the particle in a direction perpendicular to motion of the particle so the force which is perpendicular to motion of the particle that is called as lift force so other force i can have is lift force okay now other than drag and lift this is also one term then this is second term this is third term and this is fourth term so can you think of what can be these other four forces which i have written over here for a generic very generic system it means very generic system means this system can have both acceleration of the particle as well as acceleration of the fluid what can be forces we have seen that in case of uniform motion of the particle drag and lift are coming so drag and lift i have already accounted gravity i have accounted 
Now I have four other forces which I have listed over here for unsteady particle motions. Now what are these uh, four forces? Can you get some idea? Accounted in gravity? So first we will be having this v vector is velocity of the particle, u vector is velocity of the continuous field. So and this v is volume of particle. So here you can see this rho is density of the continuous field. So this du by dt minus g is to account for the acceleration of the fluid. So because of the acceleration of the continuous fluid, whatever forces are acting on particle, that is this first term. Because gravity effect already we have accounted there. So that is why gravity effect like buoyancy force if we have to account. So that is accounted for over there. So uh, gravity of the like uh, uh, fluid mass is actually subtracted equivalent to that of particle. Okay. Then what is F A? What is F A? Sorry? Which force? No. This is called as added mass force. Okay. What is the meaning of added mass? No, this is a constant volume. The meaning of added mass is if you have a solid sphere or any other solid object, when the object is accelerating, a, accelerating in a fluid, this will not only move through and completely separate out the remaining fluid, but a part of the remaining fluid will be sticking to the particle and that will also be moving with the particle. Okay. So as a whole, if you experience, the mass of particle will be modified. So whatever be the existing mass of the particle, in comparison to that, the experienced mass of the particle will be more because some fluid which is just adhered to the particle that will be doing the similar, that will be having similar acceleration as that of the particle. So that is why we have to also add that particular mass of the fluid in the acceleration component. So that is called as added mass force. I will show the formulation subsequently. And then we have FH. FH is called as history force. What is the meaning of history force? Whenever a particle is accelerating in a fluid, it generates some vertical structures and wave structures. Okay. So these wave structures are having generation of some vorticity field and ultimately that vorticity field gets convective, convected and diffused into the remaining portion of the fluid. So when that force is, so it means if a particle has moved at certain time through this point and say after some time this particle is at some new location, then whatever the wake or vorticity field it has induced previously, that will also affect its motion in the subsequent time step because it is affecting the surrounding continuous fluid motion. So because of this, whatever force is coming, that is called as time history force. And fourth is additional force. So additional force will come like if you have more effects into the system. For example, if your particle is moving and then you, you have added some magnetic field into your system. So then that will come. If you have added some electric field into the system, then some additional electric force will come. Okay. So typically, if you simply consider that you have a very simple system, 
in which fluid is not accelerating only particle is accelerating then also you will have this term this term and these four forces term okay so it means unsteady motion of the particles is actually not very easy now till now it is it seems very easy i have simply written fd fl fa fh but what are the values of fd fa fh fl so that is also again a complicated task okay but all these forces are nothing but coming from single contribution and what is that single contribution integral of sigma dot ds along the surface of the particle so all these forces are nothing but result of the interaction of particle with its surrounding surface okay so all the forces on right hand side other than this weight of the particle whatever i am writing over here these are contributed from the surface effect okay so it means if you have to see the full fledged derivation of these individual components what you need to do you need to start from integral of sigma dot ds and then when you will be expanding the different terms of this particular surface force component then you will be getting all these forces as the outcome of this single quantity okay so of course this is unsteady particle motion again it's a very uh, like uh, very detailed thing if we have to determine from first principle the values of each and every force we will not go to that much detail just for your understanding i have shown you this uh, slide now we will quickly move from our next lecture to the theoretical analysis of the system where a uh, large number of particles are available in a surrounding continuous fluid so how we can model that type of system and then after that when i will be uh, specifically talking about the numerical techniques or numerical methods used for solution of multi phase flow problems then i will once again come back to this particular uh, equation and whenever i will be specifically talking about one method called as lagrangian point particle approach okay so whenever you do your numerical simulations maybe unknowingly you may not know but whenever you use ansys fluent and then you consider say you are injecting some particles in the flow and then studying the motion of these particles in the flow then ultimately you are actually solving this particular equation okay so whenever i will be discussing the solution of uh, uh, <clears throat> uh this numerical solution of the multi phase flow problems using the different uh, numerical models available there once again i will actually come back to this equation and i will discuss this in more detail uh, moreover i have included some additional discussion on added mass force in this particular uh lecture but uh, maybe uh, in the interest of time i will skip this and if you are interested so you can just uh, uh, go through these slides and some uh, uh, literature from your textbooks okay